the question, as I understand, was uh, uh, what gets you up in the morning to do the thinking and the work you do. And uh, for me, uh, that is to tackle the great enemy of crummy management theories. Uh, and they're crummy management theories that are in operation in business and, and are taught widely in business schools. Uh, and why I'm as passionate as I am about it is I spend a whole lot of my time in uh, 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 consulting to senior executives, mainly CEOs in companies and all sorts of industries around the world. So I see what um, what they actually do and how they actually think and what the, the influences are. And um, it drives me crazy when they are... Uh, putting in place, utilizing models that are are like, you know, kind of silly, dumb, uh, counterproductive, all of those things. Um, so, uh, you know, the business world utilizes models and we teach them in business education, like um, revenue forecasting is important and useful. Uh, boards help solve the principal agent problem. Uh, strategy and planning are the same thing. Strategy and execution are different. Stock-based compensation aligns the interests of management and shareholders. Monetary incentive compensation has a positive impact on entity performance. Decisions based on rigorous data analysis are always superior. Uh, the key is to get more than you give uh, in acquisitions. These are all things that we teach and are widely accepted in the business world. And there is no logic or data that supports them. And there's lots that uh, works against uh, uh, those, right? The guy who invented data analytics, Aristotle, as I have pointed out, warned against using data analysis in the part of the world where things can be other than they are. And that's dominantly the world of business, right? So we literally, we literally uh, teach in, in business schools, we teach uh, students in, in their required first year statistics course, which most business schools uh, have, we teach them that uh, unless you have a representative sample, extrapolating to a universe is a terrible, terrible mistake, right? Uh, then we, uh, then they walk across to uh, the next classroom and take a marketing course or a strategy course or a finance course or whatever. And they are told the only good decisions are decisions made with rigorous data analytics, right? And then they're told to analyze the past to pro project what will happen in the future, right? And, and uh, the notion behind that implicitly is the future has to be identical to the past. Otherwise, the sample from the past will not be a representative sample of the universe you're trying to apply it to, to extrapolate to, right? It's not. So we have, we teach a schism. We teach X in statistics and not X in, uh, in uh, uh, marketing strategy, et cetera. It's appalling. And so we get all these, all these uh, folks going out into the business world and saying to their people, uh, you have to do rigorous data analysis before you make any decision. The guy who invented rigorous data analysis said, don't do that, never do that. That is a terrible uh, idea. So I'm, that's what that's what gets me up in the morning. Um, there are some of them that I, I kind of think of, uh, right? I've been, I've been talking about uh, the fact that stock-based compensation fundamentally disaligned the interests of management and, and shareholders for, well, I don't know, over uh, well over a, a decade. And it seems to be we're coming around a little bit uh, on that one, which is which is great. Uh, the uh, strategy and execution are different things. Uh, that one I've been on for a long time, but that's taking a while. But I draw my inspiration for what it's worth from Peter Drucker, who was incredibly lovely and nice and nice to me. He was highly supportive of what I did at the Rotman School. Even said what I'm doing 
uh, maybe the most important uh, thing going on in business education today. So that was that was gorgeous. Uh, but generally speaking, what uh, Peter Drucker did was say and kind of X at time Y, uh, at, at which everybody everybody uh, says you're nuts, Peter. Uh, and then at, at at time Y plus twenty five years, uh, they were saying duh, that you kind of that's obvious. Uh, like pension funds are going to save capitalism, uh, right? Uh, said in '76, and it was obvious that pension funds were the biggest uh, investors in the uh, uh, equity markets. Uh, 25 years uh, later, but it sounded crazy uh, at the time. So that's that's what I do. Uh, I'm I'm uh, taking on uh, crummy models that uh, that make companies uh, worse off. And since companies kind of control huge amounts of financial assets, physical assets, um, human assets, uh, and deploy them, if they're using bad models, the world is a, is a worse place fundamentally than it could otherwise be. And so I'm attempting to, to do my little part to close the gap between what humans could accomplish in the domain of business or organizations in, in, in general, what they, because this applies to nonprofits as well. Uh, that's another thing I agree with Peter Drucker on, like you got to work on that sector too. So if we could close the gap between what humans should be able to accomplish if they're using good models and what they do accomplish if they're using bad models, it'll make the world a considerably better place. And if I can have that, uh, impact even in a, in a little way, I'm, I will be uh, pleased and, uh, and see it as, as worthwhile. And that's what gets me up in the morning and keeping on working on, uh, uh stuff. Uh, the next book, by the way, uh, is, is going to be on, uh, uh, on the fact that, uh, humans can't scale and, and, uh, businesses scale like crazy. Uh, and and the schism between the scale of humans and the scale of business has now made people feel tiny and insignificant uh, in their companies. And that's why we have the level of disengagement in, bus in uh, businesses that we currently do. And so it's a book about how you can, how you can uh, have strategy produce companies that have a human feeling scale. But with that, I will uh, I will stop. I'm happy to answer any Roger, questions on all of this inflammatory stuff. Can you hear me, Roger? You can now. Yeah, hopefully. yeah, I can. Yeah. yeah, got a couple of questions for you. Yeah. What What is your favorite management theory to critique? Um, right now it is probably um, either the distinction between strategy and execution, which is. Uh, which is <laughs> unhelpful and uh, dumb, or or probably the idea that revenue forecasting is a useful exercise. Those probably would be the two that that get under my skin uh, the most because they both have have really uh, terrible implications. So the first on strategy versus execution uh, lets strategists off the hook because they can actually they actually make this completely specious argument that that was a great strategy. It was just badly executed. There's no such, that's a unicorn. There's no such thing that, that exists. Uh, so they let themselves off the hook and then they blame uh, all the, the hoi polloi for, uh, for bad execution. So it, it uh, undermines the, the functioning of the organization and is dumb. And those two things together make it uh, a target. Okay, I'm gonna love so for the follow up. Really, how can we distinguish between bad versus good models? What are the key attributes? Do they work? Right, it literally is. I I don't mean to be facetious at all at all, uh, Des. It's it's look and ask the question. So when we moved to aligning the interests of management and shareholders with stock-based compensation. There was a giant move in that direction in the 80s and 90s in that 20-year period. And then you have to ask, oh, did that produce the results that we expected? No, it didn't. It produced by and large the opposite uh, opposite results. So so it's just standard, standard stuff. 
watch a model and you know you have to say in advance what i think this model will do for me right and then you know it's sort of like monetary incentive compensation will get better work from uh from our from our people and our organization will do better let's check how's about we just check uh and and if you check and and oops it doesn't then rather than saying oh well should we should we make it work uh should should we kind of try it again you know well hmm. Maybe not. Okay, I'm going to slightly undermine my own question now, but previous question. How can we avoid, I know you're big on all the thinking models. How can we avoid the bind of binary thinking, especially in the West, the difference between, you know, sort of the simplistic good or bad, black or white. How can we have a better way of thinking? And you've got oh, a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I, I mean, the... the... I, I've I've written I've written about about something similar, uh, Des, and I'll, I'll say this. What I what I say is that the human mind is inclined to either uh, because we have such a, a high inclination to analogize. We either say when we see something that's the same as this, or that's different than this. So we go to these extremes, and and you're you're viewing you're you're giving me an example of another uh, another extreme. We've just got two binary binary uh, kind of options. What I say on same and difference is the more sophisticated the thinkers say, even though my mind is telling me that's the same, I must think about all the ways in which it's different. And even though my mind is going to that's different, that's not the same. I need to uh, understand the what the ways it is the same. I think it's the same kind of subtlety of thinking that that will will help you on on uh, on being binary. It's if if you say uh, what what about op possibility A uh, uh, is interesting and intriguing. What's and what's interesting and intriguing about possibility B, and is there any way? You could get the stuff that's interesting and intriguing about each and put them together rather than obsessing about how these two things are different from one another and incompatible. And okay, it turns out you, if you do that, you can you can come up with third, fourth, fifth uh, different ways that are better. Fantastic. OK, Roger, we're, we're out of time, I'm afraid. I mean, I could talk about this integrative thinking stuff for a long time with you. I, I find it fascinating, but thank you for your time. Roger Martin, everyone. Thank you. You take care. <laughs>